comments and then we'll take our, our sort of lunchtime break and then come back and carry on from the, just to be respectful to the deputants that we keep moving on. Okay, so Madam Clerk, as announced, we're at the Regional Council meeting of Thursday, February 11. First dirty to you, the roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll begin with Councillor Singh. Present. Thank you. Councillor Carlson. Councillor Carlson. Yes. I think yes. I heard present. Yes, thank you. Mayor Crombie. Mayor Crombie. Councillor DeMurla. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Dasco. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Downey. Present. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fortini. Present. Thank you. Councillor Groves. Present. Thank you. Councillor Ennis. Present. Thank you. Councillor Kovac. Present. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney. Present. Thank you. Councillor McFadden. Present. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros. Here. Thank you. Councillor Pileshi. Present. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Raz. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sato. Here. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sinclair. Present. Thank you. Councillor Starr. Present. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Present. Thank you. Councillor Vicente. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our Indigenous land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather and which the Region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give our respect to its first inhabitants. Do I have any declarations of conflict of interest? Hearing none, I need the approval of the minutes from the January 14 meeting as moved by councillors Downey and Sato. Are there any objectors? That carries, thank you. And I'm on to the approval of the agenda. I have a motion here from Councillor Fonseca and Mayor Thompson, noting that the Delegation 7.2 on today's Regional Council meeting has been withdrawn, and further that the agenda for February 11, 2021 Regional Council meeting be approved as amended. Anybody opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. We go to our consent agenda, so we have our two delegates that we'll hear from shortly. Mr. Chair? We're gonna, uh, Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes. It's Carolyn Parrish? Yes. Um, under approval of the agenda, I was going to ask to move 24 floor to public session, but I had a conversation or a, a text conversation with Patrick O'Connor, and I'm going to discuss it when we get to 24 floor. He is going to tell me why it's in, in camera, and I'm going to suggest it shouldn't be. So we'll have a little debate. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Okay. Just uh, you yes. Know. No, thank you. Duly noted. Thank you. Um, so getting on Mr. with... Chair, I, oh, Mr. Yes. Chair, Mayor Crombie, I stepped away to go to the ladies' room. I may have missed roll call. We got you. Uh, duly noted that you're present and we're never away, so to speak. Thank you. Okay, so now we're down to two delegates that we will deal with shortly. Then we will follow it with the COVID updates. I'm on to communications. Madam Clerk? Um, sorry. Um, I had the approval of the... And I'm working on our consent agenda as we speak. Yes. Oh, you are. Yes, so on the con I had the approval of agenda, I believe. Yep, we're confirming. So on to the consent agenda. I'm down to items nine under communication, asking if anyone would like to hold matters or otherwise what is on consent. On consent, 9.1. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. Could, could, I make, could I make a request, please? Um, this came from our Accessibility Advisory Committee at the city. Um, Mem people who are watching this who have accessibility issues um, can't follow along if we just read out the number on the consent agenda. 
So we were asked and we've implemented at the city of Mississauga to read the uh, read what it is. Gotcha. Okay, very appropriate. Councillor Sato, very appropriate and I am happy to. So with regards asking for consent on items, I will make note of what the individual item is so that we're inclusive for all. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Item 9.1 from Christine Massey, email dated January 14, 2021, providing an article, what vaccine trials, no study results, recommended here for a receipt. Do I have consent? Yes, thank you. Item 9.2, Frank N. Marocco, Chair, Commissioner Angela Koch, Commissioner, and Dr. Jack Kitts, Commissioner, Ontario's Long-Term Care COVID-19 Commission, on consent, the letter that we've received. Thank you. Uh, from Sasha Smith, Manager, Legislative Services and Deputy Clerk, City of Mississauga. Email dated January 20, 2021, providing a copy of the City of Mississauga resolution requesting the Premier of Ontario to place more stringent controls on big box stores. On consent... Thank you. 9-4, from Mayor Thompson, email dated January 21, 2021, providing a copy of a letter from Erin Kids requesting priority sequencing for phase one of vaccine implementation. On consent. 9-5, from a retired General Hillier Chair, COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Tax Force, a letter received providing a COVID-19 vaccine program update. On consent, 9-6, Peggy Saltler, MPP London West, letter dated January 25, 2021, requesting support for private member's bill, 239, stay home if you are sick, here for receipt. On consent, David Wojcik, President and Chief Executive Officer, Mississauga Board of Trade, letter dated January 29, 2021, providing a copy of a letter to Mississauga members of Parliament and members of Provincial Parliament regarding paid sick leave, here for receipt as well. On consent. And 9.8, Sonia Pacheco, Legislative Coordinator, City of Brampton, letter dated February 8, 2021, <laughs> providing a copy of the City of Brampton resolution regarding a joint COVID-19 communication campaign, also related to item 8.2. On consent. Thank you all. Moving on, items related to public works. Item 11.1, .1, salt management. On consent, item 11.2, report on the Waste Management Strategic Advisory Committee meeting held on January 21 of this year. Hold, hold Asked please, to be held. Councillor Sato. Thank you, Councillor Sato. 11.2 to be held at the request of Councillor Sato. Communications item under 12, 12.1, 12 Scott Besco and Jerry Merkley, residents, Town of Caledon, Ward 3, on behalf mm -hmm. of the Caledon East residents, a petition received December 24, 2020, signed by 185 Caledon East residents in opposition to the Region of Peel environmental assessment change to the Old Church Road, Airport Road intersection, here for receipt on consent. Oh. Oh, asked, to be, asked, asked to be held by Councillor Sinclair. Thank you. 12.2, Andrea Warren, Interim Commissioner of Public Works. Memo dated February 1, 2021, regarding truck traffic on Highway 50, Resolution 2020, 1124. Receipt recommended, and we're working on follow-up meetings from the requests that we've received from some members of council that will be coming in the days to come. Do I have consent? On consent, thank you. Items related to health. 13.1, Report of the Health System Integrated Committee, meeting held on January 21, 2021. On consent, thank you. We go back communications, no human services, no communications items related, items related to planning and growth, communication items stemming from them. 18.1 is Laura Hall, Director, Corporate Services and Town Clerk, Town of Caledon, Letter dated January 20, 2021, providing a copy of the Town of Caledon resolution regarding appointments to the Region Appeal Planning and Growth Management Committee. Receipt is recommended. On consent? Thank you. 18.2, Heather Watt, Manager, Community Planning and Development, West Municipal Services Office of Central Ontario, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Letter dated January 22, 2021, providing a copy of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing Notice of Final Decision for the Regional Official Plan Amendment 34, here for receipt. Also on consent, items related to enterprise programs and services. 19.1, TerraNet Exchange Delivery System and Mapping Document. On consent, 19.2, Councillor Newsletter Distribution Process here for information. On consent, 19.3, Report of the Audit and Risk Committee meeting held January 21 of this year. On consent, 19.4, Report of the Diversity, Equity and Anti-Racism Committee meeting held on January 21, 2021. On consent, Communication Item 22. 
0.1. From Mayor Thompson of Caledon, letter dated January 20, 2021, advising of a town of Caledon resolution regarding Region Appeal Bylaw 83-2020, changing the composition of Regional Council here for receipt. On consent, we'll deal with other business at the time. We have a notice of motion that I will deal with at the time. And I'm going to go to the in-camera and speak to what can be dealt with, um, that staff can get back to work, we don't have to deal with, and what has to be held. Councillor Parrish, you've referenced 24.4 that you would like held and we will speak to uh, when we go in camera. But items 24.2, an expropriation, do I have consent or do we need to go in camera for that one? Very good. So 24.2 dealt with on consent. 24.1 that I skipped over to receive the closed minute minutes from the last in camera. Do I have consent on the minutes of the last in camera? Thank you. I've dealt with 24.2. 24.3, surplus declaration of land and uh, eliminating a portion or disposing of a portion of regionally owned land. Do I have consent or do we need to go in camera for 24.3? On consent, so Councillor Paris, we just need, will be going in camera with regards to your query regarding 24.4. Very good. Madam Clerk, you're advising me that 8.2, can we see if we have consent for interim report 8.2? Let me be sure. Interim report 8.2 falls under the COVID information. It is the 2021 communication update for COVID-19 and the mass vaccine plan. Here from information. Did we have consent with regards to 8.2? Sure. Very good. Oh, very, Councillor Pileshi, that is? That's the communication for the COVID? Yes, it is. Yes, hold. Very good. 8.2 asked to be held by Councillor Pileshi. Madam Clerk, I think that's run through all of them. So I will have the vote for what is on consent over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll begin with Councillor Singh. Councillor Singh? Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demerola? Yes, thank you. Councillor Demerola in favor. Councillor Dasco? Yes. Councillor Dasco in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, in favor. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes, in favor. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? In favor. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Councillor Kovac? Yes, in favor. In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? In favor. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? In favor. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? In favor. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? In favor. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? In favor. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? In favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor, and that carries. Thank you. Thank you. That deals with our consent agenda, and we go right to our two delegates who we thank for their patience. First up, 7.1. Clinton Barreto, Clinical Director, and Amik Singh, Nurse in Charge, Homeless Health Peel. Thanking the Region of Peel for providing community access to isolation centers, providing information on the work done by Homeless Health Peel during the pandemic. Welcome to you all, and I remind you of our five-minute to delegation time limit. So welcome, and please proceed. Uh, good, good morning, uh, uh, Chair, and through you, to, good morning to all of the regional councillors. My name is Clinton Barreto. I'm the nurse practitioner and clinical director of Homeless Health Peel. Uh, 
and I'm just here to, to thank you all and to tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing since the pandemic started. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, sorry, I'm just going to... Uh... Um, so Homeless Health Peel was started by seven nurses, including myself, uh, to provide care at uh, one of the original isolation centers uh, in the region of Peel. And since then, we've expanded to support the two new isolation centers. So our staff have gone from seven to 31 in the last two months. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, we have our, uh, our outreach clinic downtown Brampton, and we'll be talking about our work in a second. But we have a, a very different philosophy. We have four main philosophies of trauma-informed practice, harm reduction, self-determination and, aut and autonomy. And we use that for our staff as well as our, the, the patients we serve. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, I'll leave Amit to talk about our work. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor, through you, Chair. Um, so our work primarily started because of COVID. Um, and as we can see, because of the outbreak and the the spread of COVID in Peel region, we had to support a lot of people that were part of our community. So we've supported people um, that have uh, COVID positive test results for our close contacts to people that are uh, COVID positive, And we're also supporting the most vulnerable people in the region as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we learned a few lessons uh, over the last nine months as we've been doing this work. One is that precariously housed individuals also have precarious medical access. They don't necessarily have family doctors. They don't necessarily have stable walking clinics to go to. And certainly with uh, with COVID, with access to, to medicine and to healthcare going virtual, individuals that didn't have phones were right away excluded from that. We also learned that we need to do a lot to prevent vulnerable individuals from being exploited, especially seniors, as a lot of the individuals we serve ended up having underlying issues that are family issues, home issues that we needed to take into consideration as well too. And the most important lesson that we learned is the integration of social services, housing and primary care is a must in our in our region. And historically, it is uh, we've all operated in silos coming from a primary care background. You know, we never really engaged with social services and housing. And what we've seen over the last nine months is that when the three services get together, there's a lot of good work that can be done for the, for the benefit of the, the client and the patient. And most uh, and the, the, um, the takeaway lesson is that we don't operate in silos. We are completely integrated and, and we need to continue doing that well past the pandemic. Next slide, please. So a, a big shout out to our partners, because uh, we have we would not have been able to do this by ourselves. Firstly, at the region of Peel, Dr. Lowe and his team at Public Health, the public health nurses supporting us have been absolutely brilliant. And a huge shout out to the folks in housing. Both of you guys are paying them, it's not enough. They've been absolutely brilliant through all of this too. Uh, and I'm spearheaded uh, the, both the original isolation center as well as the expansion. Um, our colleagues at the Salvation Army in SHIP providing social service supports for us. Our colleagues at Regen. Who we've been working closely with around discharges from hospital and, and transfers to hospital. Same with Trillium Health Partners and so many others. The, the most uh, important one that comes to mind is Punjabi Community Health Services, who we're working with too, and, and they just uh, got their isolation center going yesterday, which is really, really exciting. And it's exciting for us to have so many wonderful organizations supporting us and us supporting them and have an opportunity to work together with them. Next slide, please. And we'd also like to thank Council, Regional Council. Um, if it wasn't for the constant advocacy from um, the Region Appeal, um, our City of Brampton, City of Mississauga, the Town of Caledon, we would not be here. Um, it's refreshing to see governance moving at such a fast pace um, during COVID. And I hope that this continues post COVID at, as well. Um, your countless advocacy for um, even um, sick, sick pay and the advocacy efforts that Region 
appeal is taking and City of Mississauga, City of Brampton and Town of Calder are taking to support uh, the residents' appeal. That is truly amazing. So we want to take a moment to appreciate the hard work that council is doing, the long Zoom calls and consultation meetings, and even approving the budget just now. I want to give a big shout out to council for taking the time and the experience in governance. Next slide, please. So it's been one year since COVID has uh, landed in Canada, since Region Appeal has been impacted uh, by COVID here. Um, we know the type of industries that live here, the people, the work that's being done. Um, our data suggests that this is something that's going to go on for a very long time. Um, hopefully, when the immunization uh, kicks in, we are in a much better place. But in in addition to all of that, uh, I want to make sure that we're part of the fabric um, of providing health services and community services because of the insights we've learned due to COVID. We want to make sure that this uh, carries on um, in the future. So I want to just leave that. This is what we've done so far in the pandemic, but post-pandemic, based on the insights we've learned, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, collaboration so we can be part of the fabric of uh, community service and health services here in Peel. Thank you. So in, in the coming months, we're going to be collecting all of our data. And we're gentlemen, uh, Clinton, I'm going to thank you. You've got about another, you've reached the five minute point. Why don't you take a minute yeah. more to wrap up, please? Sure. Um, we just want to leave you with a little taste of what's to come. Uh, and we're just collecting all of our data over the last year. And we're going to be working with regional staff uh, who will work with all of our partners as well, too. And we'll be coming back to you. Uh, later on this year with a, a much richer look at the work we've been doing and, and the, the wonderful work that you have advocated for. And, and that's it from us. Gentlemen, thank you very much. You've done great work. We appreciate it. And we have questions. Councillor Singh. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge and thank these two. Uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with them, especially when it comes to additional isolation centers in uh, Brampton. Uh, and that's something myself and the mayor advocated for with the uh, backing of all the council and supported unanimously. Uh, and um, it, it's remarkable to see that we got the results. It, it's amazing to see you two uh, leading when it comes to health care and diverse communities in particular, helping with outreach. So keep it up. And I'll be looking forward to seeing what that uh, data reveals uh, to us, because I think it'll uh, show some things, uh, you know, and uh, some research that can help guide policy, especially public health policy in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. I have no other questioners. So Councillor Singh and Councillor Dillon, if uh, you'd move in second receipt, do I have anybody opposed? That is carried. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation and your very good works. Okay, moving on. Thank Next delegation, 7.2 has been withdrawn for a later date, so we're on to 7.3. Masood Khan, resident city of Brampton, regarding high water bill. Uh, Masood, you're up. Mr. Khan, Masood, can you hear me? Over to staff, can you tell me electronically whether he shows up, so to speak? Yep, yeah, he's present. So, Masood, electronically, I'm advised you're with us. Um, we're waiting for you to link in so that we can hear your presentation. I seem to recall we had a technical difficulty with Mr. Khan last time. Is that is that not right? So, Mr. Chair, I, I know oh. that uh, Mr. Khan is on, but he may be having difficulty unmuting it. Perhaps we could move on to uh, the next item and then go back to Mr. Khan and if staff could connect with him to provide assistance. I am happy to do so, but I will advise you that the only remaining presentation is Dr. Lowe's presentation. and. That can take some time, and I wanted to have grabbed our break also before then, Understood. but I'm in, I'm in council's hand. Uh, great suggestion if it was just another five or ten minute presentation, but that regularly takes over an hour, uh, and I'm sure we have a lot of questions to Dr. Lowe about the whole COVID file. So I'm going to try again to Mr. Khan, if you can hear me. Technical staff, any help you can give us?
right? And, and the staff is sending the request to unmute. I, I do so at the same time. Now, uh, if, Mr. Khan, if you can make sure you're unmuted, but I'm sure a lot of people are already telling you that. Well, here is what I'm going to suggest, if I may, my colleagues. Um, why don't we call it now for our lunch break, knowing we still have a lot of work to get to. When we come back in half an hour or so, uh, I'm going to say at 1240, we will call up Mr. Khan immediately then, and maybe in the next 25, 30 minutes, staff might be able to work out the technical ease of it. So with that, I'm going to call for our lunch break till 1240. Mr. Khan, we've got you up at 1240, and I hope this gives us half an hour or so to try and sort you out, because we want to, because we know it's your second time, and, and fortunately, we've run into these difficulties. So uh, i call the recess till 1240 when Mr. Khan is up. Thank you all. Okay, everyone, welcome back and thank you. We are back in session. And uh, my thanks to the staff and to Masood. I know we're trying furtively to try and make that work. So here we are at 1240. Uh, back to Delegation 73, Masood Khan, resident appeal regarding high water bill. Masood, I'm calling out your name and hoping I'm going to hear you. So Mr. Khan, can you hear me and give us your delegation? Okay, why, why we keep trying. I know, Councillor Vincente, you've been helpful in working on the file. The staff mentioned everybody in here in the last half hour has really been trying to make the best effort of it. Very unfortunate it hasn't worked. But I understand, Councillor Vincente, uh, Mr. Khan said that in the absence of trying to get it, and I'm going to try him one more time, that you might be able to share some of his concerns with us. So I'm going to try one more time to see if Masood can hear me and can connect and give us his delegation right now. And failing that, Councillor Vicente, I'm going to turn it over to you on his behalf again with our apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that Mr. Khan can't uh, figure out the, the sound here. He, I know that he can see the WebEx session and can hear us. So um, Mr. Khan did provide us with some correspondence that uh, in lieu of him being able to present today, he has asked for me to bring forward. Can we do that at this time, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. I think it's appropriate that you, on his behalf, advocate, given that, you know, it's fallen apart on us twice now. So please, within the five minutes, Let's go ahead. Thank you. And, and if Mr. Chair and so members of council, I'm sure you've seen the correspondence. It's in the agenda package. We have a resident here from the city of Brampton uh, that uh, both Councillor Santos and I represent. And uh, he had a very uh, extremely spurious bill uh, that he experienced. Uh, and I believe staff is prepared to comment on this. Um, is there someone from staff who would be able to answer just a few questions? If uh, I'll acknowledge any staff that are aware of the file and can help us out here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. It's Andrea. Yes, please proceed, Andrea. Yes, uh, thank please. you. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Andrea. So, like this resident experienced uh, a one time. Uh, bill that uh, is very unusual. Normally his bill is very steady, but he's had a $500 bill, which is very unusual. It's a significant amount of water. Um, I know that staff have been working with him to check out the meter and to try to troubleshoot what's happening here. Would staff be able to just comment uh, for members of council to understand what has been done and what investigations were made? Yes, uh, good afternoon uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I'd be pleased to, uh, to respond to the question. So first off, we certainly um, appreciate the, the perseverance and diligence of, of Mr. Khan in, in terms of bringing the, the, uh, the issues forward. We have been uh, working with him. Um, so the, the unfortunate uh, reality that, you know, we do get these issues that come to us. Um, you know, we have over 1.3 million invoices issued every year and a very small percentage of them, you know, we hear about, so less than 1%. And uh, in Mr. Khan's instance, uh, and uh, Steve, Mr. Steve Fenton is here as direct, the director, if there's anything more detailed, but I know the team has been um, in contact with him. And the issue is, is that it was a limited period of time where there was the elevated high water bill amount. And, and rightly, as you've indicated, uh, it's traditionally been very consistent and a, a notable pattern. So with over 335,000 clients, um, you know, the region really 
um, has never taken the position that we would we presume what the water consumption patterns are uh, for our clients. And traditionally, what happens on the private side is the responsibility of the client. And on the region side, we're, we're essentially responsible uh, for municipal matters. So we don't presume, presume to know what has happened in this instance. We have faith in the meter. Um, the meter is only at about half of its life. Um, and we know that in order for the meter to turn, the water actually has to flow through. So the water has been consumed. And it's, it, it is unfortunate, and we do, do, do feel sympathetic to the situation. Uh, but the reality is that the water has been used and, and, and the bill needs to be paid. So we are um, open to entering into uh, payment arrangements with Mr. Khan, um, as we would with, with other clients that would come forward in terms of making sure that, you know, the issue is resolved accordingly. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, in reference to the meter, and I know in our audit committee uh, staff uh, recently underwent an audit of some of the uh, water uh, testing specifically to our water meters, but is there any possibility in this situation? Um, I believe, uh, according to the correspondence, the home, I guess, was built in 2010, so it's only 10 years old. Is there any possibility that the meter has failed in some way? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we are, we're very confident in the meter. Um, the consumption patterns and the billing amounts have returned to normal. They've normalized. So if there was a pattern of overtime where, you know, it continued to be erratic or sporadic, uh, then we would, we would certainly um, question the meter itself. Uh, in terms of the reference to the water meter audit, um, there, the good news is on that in terms of the testing protocol is that there was no major findings in that regard. So overall, um, we're very confident in the meter and the meter's function. Uh, Mr. Khan's bill has normalized, and uh, it, it's, it's an unfortunate instance that happens sometimes. And again, we really reiterate the support for flexible payment arrangements. Now, you mentioned before that in, uh, through you, Chair, um, that about, we have about, is it 1% or less than 1%? of all billing where this happens? It's less than 1% where we get billing inquiries. Would you say that that's a high number or a reasonable number? I would say it's a very reasonable, very reasonable number. And through you, Chair, um, I'm not sure what else we can do here. So in situations where this has happened in those 1% of cases, um, and I know we've had these requests to council before. Uh, what is the go forward? Uh, what is the next step? What can we do? Uh, through you, um, and Mr. Chair, again, I reiterate staff support to, to uh, again, to connect with Mr. Khan and to offer flexible payment arrangements. Now, Mr. Khan, in his correspondence through chair has asked for us to handle the small amount, small to us, but significant to him, uh, is that something that the region can do? Sorry, just to clarify in terms of what, what you're asking in terms of handling it. Well, I'm just looking at the, my humble request is to authorize your management to handle this small dispute in your office rather than bringing dispute to council, but I, I'm guessing that he's looking for a reimbursement of this amount. Again, I would just reiterate uh, the, the historical position and approach, um, historical approach that this council has taken to, um, to require that the bill be paid. So this is based on previous council direction and um, it would be precedent setting in this regard. So again, uh, I, we would certainly uh, reach out to, to the resident again uh, to offer repayment options. So just to be clear through you, Chair, Council has never waived an, an amount like this, an extra amount billed on a water bill? 
I think I as chair can say I'm pretty sure no. I don't think we've ever, and they come from time to time, and 500's a lot. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's been considerably more. And um, the meter read the water unless we think there is a problem with the meter, and we test it, and uh, we're satisfied that it worked properly. The, the water was consumed or... or uh, it came out the pipe, so to speak, and as long as we're sure our pipes are in good repair, uh, I'm pretty sure, I see Councillor Sato nodding as well, she's been around as long as I have, we we don't um, step up where we think everything was in working order and the water was consumed. Uh, Councillor Vincente, I've still got you on my list, I have a couple more speakers, then maybe I can come back to you if you wish to hear the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pelleschi and Sato. Councillor Pelleschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I was just going to weigh in to say <clears throat> we haven't... Uh, Time to time, they do come. Um, we've we've never um, taken care of a water bill, but what we what we I think we always do, Councillor Vincente, is ask staff to go back and work with the uh, work with the resident to to see what kind of payment payment plan uh, we can put them put them through so it doesn't uh, so they can draw out the payment and, and not have it hurt so much um, right at the at the onset not the at the get go. Um, the one question I had, though, is in and you, Andrew, you referenced the one percent, and I think it's less than one percent uh, for my question. But you can clarify: How many times have we had a meter uh, a defect be defective whenever we've gone out to look at it? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. And uh, Mr. Fanton is here uh, in session with us. So, uh, Steve, I'm going to ask, uh, if you don't mind, because you're much closer to the details, if you could please speak to that. Great. Thank you, uh, through the chair. I, I apologize. I don't have the stats in front of me readily available, but what I can say is very few and far between. Um, not enough that we're actually keeping track. Um, it, it's small. I, I, I could uh, definitely uh, get the number for you and, and report back, but uh, I'd, I'd say with confidence that it's extremely small to the point that it's, it's not worthwhile tracking. Yes, and that's kind of, I think it was last term that <clears throat> staff brought forward a, a, a number and it was around, you know, 0.6 or something. It was, we didn't really track it, but but in, in terms of whatever <laughs> work that they could do, that's what they were able to bring forward. And, and actually, sorry, if, if, if I may through the chair, I just uh, received from feedback from my team, um, it's the actually number is zero, actually. Um, oh, so zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, thought yeah, there was, yeah. I thought there may have been a, a couple, but yeah, typically we just, you know, it's, it's. do we do we know, it's too bad Masood's not on the line, do we know if he had a leak? Did we, um, any conversation, like a leak after the, after the meter? Not through the chair, not that he's communicated to us, but what what leads me to believe that there's a good chance it would have been is that the consumption through the meter returned back to normal on the next bill. So whatever took place at that point in time, there was extra water usage over a short period, whether it was a leak or whether something somebody did something intentionally in the household he's not aware of. I, I, I can't speak to what actually happened in his household, um, but what I can tell you that it did return to normal. So whatever did take place that caused the high water consumption, it was temporary in nature. That That's the extent of how I can comment. And without seeing the consumption in front of me, is that typical uh, when, when you know, you have a, a, a toilet running even throughout the, the, the billing cycle? Do we know? Oh, well, it's a lot. So it, it's what makes it a bit more challenging is that we actually had a very hot summer as well. And so a lot of water, the water consumption across a lot of our residents increased quite a bit. So everyone's consumption is a lot higher. How much is for him is attributed to excess usage through a leak or through um, through warm weather, through using your sprinklers more often than you would? It's hard to draw that line. But the water consumption did increase quite a bit. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pelleschi. Councillor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councillor Vicente, um, I think we've all had requests like this from uh, from citizens, and uh, I had four on one street last uh, just last year, and staff went out, did the same thing, and it was exactly the same, uh, very high amount, very sudden, two people living in the house, two seniors, living in the house and couldn't figure out what, what that consumption was. And staff tested the meters and found that the meter was working properly. Um, we never did figure out why their water bill was so high. 
Um, but I, I basically told them that, you know, they, they could appeal, but it would be turned down by council because we, we have never, we've never done that. Um, and, and again, you know, at the time staff had advised that resident that all it really takes is, you know, one tap, um, dripping for, uh, you know, cause these, these bills are, what is it? Three months water use or four, three, right? Three, yeah. So over a three month period, you could consume a lot of water with, you know, a toilet that was continually running or a tap that was leaking or dripping or whatever. So, um, you know, I tried to explain that to them and uh, unfortunately, you know, it didn't really help. They weren't happy. But again, as, as Stephen has said, the water bills go back to normal after that. Um, they, were, they were sure that there was a glitch in the meter just for a period of time. And, you know, trying to explain to them that, no, that was not the case. But um, staff, staff are very good at working out payment plans for residents. And as you might recall, last week we passed, um, I brought a motion forward and uh, council passed it, that staff is to bring back a report on um, if there's some kind of a program that we can provide here at the region to help residents who cannot afford to pay their water bill. And they would have to be very clearly showing that they have economic um, constraints. So not just because they don't want to pay their water bill, because, you know, I look at my water bill every now and then saying, oh, wow, you know, I don't want to pay that amount. Um, but I wouldn't qualify for uh, for that assistance. So, you know, there, there hopefully will be assistance for residents. But for now, um, you know, I think all we can do is sympathize with our residents and ensure that all of the inspections were done by staff of that meter and that everything was checked outside on the region end of things, which is actually beyond the meter. So if there was a leak, Stephen, um, on the region side, it wouldn't impact the meter reading, correct? Correct. Yeah. So um, it, it's amazing, though. I think uh, maybe maybe staff can send you a list of all of the all of the things that and the amount of water that a very small leak or drip can actually use up over a three month period of time. It's not like oh, it's over three weeks. It's over three months. That's a pretty long period of time. Councillor Sato, thank you. Councillor Vicente, last word to you, and I hope you'll move receipt of the delegate as well, so to speak. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Councillor Sato and Councillor Pelleschi. And that's, I think, what would be appropriate then for us to receive uh, the correspondence and the delegation and ask the staff work with them to uh, handle the amount and to uh, manage payment of it. That is, thank you. That is the direction going back from you and Councillor Pelleschi. Um, anybody opposed to that? That is carried. Thank you very much. And again, our, our apologies to Masood that it, it didn't work out again, but hopefully we had a good kick at it, so to speak. Okay, thank you. With that, that exhausts our list of delegates. I'm on now to item eight, COVID-19 related matters and our oral update from Dr. Lawrence Lowe. Lawrence, welcome. Thank you, Chair, members of Council. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I do believe I have some slides uh, to present today, um, so I'm wondering if those can be brought up. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, uh, Chair, members of Council and uh, the public. Uh, today I will be talking about two uh, very important uh, um, issues in respect of our COVID-19 response. I will provide a, an update on uh, where we stand uh, with our community's mass vaccination plan. And then uh, I will move to discuss uh, the recent uh, provincial announcements around reopening, uh, both uh, for schools uh, as well as uh, potential return to the provincial reopening framework uh, anticipated for the 22nd of February 2021. So we'll move to the next slide, please. In starting with vaccines, we know that as one of the hardest hit communities in Ontario and Canada, it is critical that we uh, develop a robust uh, local and targeted vaccination plan that considers Peel's unique characteristics. Um, we want to uh, quickly achieve a level of vaccine coverage that will slow virus transmission and reduce rates of illness, hospitalization and death. 
Um, and to do so, we need to vaccinate at least 75% of our population, uh, you know, in priority sequence, uh, starting with uh, the most vulnerable populations. Uh, we estimate that approximately 2.3 million doses will be required to achieve this goal in the coming months. And the region of Peel is continuing to advocate to the province for higher vaccine allocations, given our unique situation and the provincial commitment to prioritize regions that have the highest rates of COVID-19 infections. Uh, the plan is uh, flexible, and there will be times where we need to adapt. Uh, for instance, uh, as recently seen, where vaccine supplies have changed. Um, so the plan was developed with this flexibility in mind to permit for continuous adjustments and to have contingencies in place uh, if we need to modify capacity uh, in a rapid fashion. At the same time, Peel Public Health does continue uh, to respond to COVID-19 transmission in the community as we have uh, through working with our hospital and healthcare partners, Ontario Health, uh, conducting case and contact management, uh, working with our enforcement partners, and providing data in the form of uh, our dashboard and other surveillance products. I also want to highlight that it is not uh, entirely public health units, uh, the public health units responsibility alone uh, in uh, having the success of our population vaccinated. It is a shared responsibility uh, with partnerships across the health system, community sectors, and local government, and also a shared responsibility together with our provincial and federal counterparts for which we uh, heavily rely on for direction as well as allocations in ensuring that we get the vaccines that our community needs. Next slide, please. As of February 7th, there have been nearly 10,000 doses administered to residents, staff, and essential caregivers on site at long -term, our long-term care and high-risk retirement homes, uh, 9,683 to be exact. Um, at this time, we are on, tr on track to complete administration of second doses uh, in these uh, facilities uh, by the 15th of February, as in the end of, uh, the end of this week uh, on Sunday. Uh, this will mean then at that point that all of our long-term care home and high-risk retirement home residents, as well as many of the workers in these facilities, will have received two doses of uh, a complete series of this protective COVID-19 vaccine. Our partners, William Osler Health System and Trillium Health Partners, as of February 7th, have also collectively administered nearly 25,000 doses, 24,447 to be exact. This counts both first and second doses, and they are in the process of starting again this weekend to finish off second doses uh, following the pause uh, that occurred uh, with the supply capacity challenges that have we're seen over the last couple of weeks. We have continued to provide updates via our public facing dashboard uh, since Monday, January 11th. And the dashboard includes doses that have been administered uh, on site in long term care retirement homes by public health. Uh, the aim in trying to provide this data is to provide uh, transparency on where our vaccine efforts are in Peel. Uh, however, we do know that many people want more data uh, and more fulsome re uh, regional reporting. And we continue to await data from the provincial tracking system uh, to ensure that we can, uh, we can provide a clearer picture around the ongoing uh, vaccination progress in our community. Next slide, please. This, uh, this visual uh, summarizes our plan for vaccination. It maps out the doses that may be received as well as planned sites for vaccination and when various po populations are anticipated to be vaccinated. Uh, you can see the priority populations on the bottom of the screen. And as, you, as has been identified, our initial priority uh, groups really are uh, seniors uh, in congregate living as well as adult home care recipients, healthcare workers, uh, adults over the age of 80 plus as identified by provincial prioritization, and also other uh, congregate and group living settings and indigenous Métis and Inuit populations. In, uh, in our planning, we have identified uh, and are anticipating that the province will then move to phase two, which will identify adults on an age-related basis, as well as individuals with certain chronic conditions that may render them vulnerable and then essential and frontline workers. And then in phase three, uh, the remaining eligible population will be able to obtain vaccinations. I will also highlight that uh, the anticipated doses from the province are above and we may be able to uh, accelerate, compress, or may have to delay uh, the phases depending on allocations and whether supply remains consistent. 
These are all estimates, and they're all based on the following assumptions. Uh, that uh, the doses that will be provided by the province uh, will uh, be per capita at this time, which is 10% provincial population in Peel. Uh, we know, uh, we, uh, another assumption is that the supply, as I mentioned, will be consistent. Uh, we have seen that with uh, shortages and or potentially with surpluses, uh, that we will change these numbers and or time frame depending on what uh, is provided. Uh, vaccination fixed sites uh, will open only if sufficient vaccine is available. And as we are learning through community engagement, uh, there will be clinics that will adapt as well to communities' needs. For instance, uh, vaccine uptake may increase if a vaccine needs to go out to a priority population uh, via a mobile uh, uh, means, for example, rather than having to get them out to a fixed clinic, such as administration on site or administration in specific housing complex, et cetera. Um, as I described, the uh, dates are not set in stone and they may change or start sooner uh, if more vaccine is available or if priority populations are vaccinated more quickly than expected. I will highlight as well in respect to priority populations that ultimately this is subject to provincial direction. And so any updates on provincial direction will be shared through the Region Appeals website and broad communications across many media channels and languages to inform all residents ex around exactly when it is their turn to, for the vaccine and how they can obtain it. We'll move to the next slide, please. Preparing for implementation encompasses identifying risks and then planning on how we will mitigate them. And as I described, this is a shared responsibility at our perspective uh, across all three levels of government. Uh, but most notably in working with uh, the provincial government, uh, we are most dependent on them uh, for a number of enablers that will assist with our, um, our uh, rollout. These next two slides highlight some of the main enablers that are necessary to help manage and mitigate some of the identified risk. So one example of risk is technology. The province has developed and rolled out an online platform called COVAX. Uh, the software is designed with several functions, such as recording vaccination data, booking appointments, tracking inventory, and managing information across settings. Um, however, uh, given our roles and responsibilities within uh, the system, we have expressed concerns around the status of, uh, of COVAX and the ability to access data uh, in terms of uh, accessing the system and the data that can be pulled from it. And we have recommended critical changes and the need to require access for necessary data to support clinical operations, inventory, and surveillance within our region. Um, we are also developing a, a parallel system for data tracking at the clinic level and adjusting an existing booking program in use at the region to capture our scheduling requirements. And also, uh, lastly, leveraging additional IT equipment that's not yet through the province in the meantime, uh, so that we are ready to go regardless of the status of COVAX. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Another key risk uh, is related to human resources, and we do recognize that uh, uh, it, it is our goal to have a significant staffing complement available for clinics uh, to quickly open. Uh, right now, we are using a variety of tactics to recruit uh, versus relying solely on a single tactic so that we can have a good quality employee pool within short timelines. Uh, this is uh, something that the province is also exploring on how to get resources on board to support health units and discussions are underway together with our local health system partners on sharing resources and centralizing onboarding and training processes. Onboarding staff is constrained by in-person training on clinic operations and the spacing requirements that are needed to do this. And we are looking at using large facilities, uh, large clinical facilities as well, uh, before they open uh, to conduct training. Other risks identified here include uh, you know, allocations of personal protective equipment, which need to come along with the vaccine, and certainly communications uh, where the province would uh, need to uh, provide a, one sort of consistent uh, provincial message, uh, message in respect to vaccination that we could then tailor uh, and target to our local groups. Next slide, please. So together with our health system and community partners, we are uh, currently uh, rolling out COVID-19 vaccines through a variety of options and clinics that have been identified here. Uh, hospitals will continue to administer vaccines at their site uh, with the ability to scale up based on supply. And we have been working with uh, several municipal partners 
uh, including local municipalities, to secure sites. Um, in, uh, in respect of the previously announced fixed sites, uh, a number of continuing discussions have identified some alternative centers that have, are now being placed here. I want to stress that uh, we will share names of sites and we'll be able to share details uh, once they are uh, finalized and that the sites may change depending on operational requirements, uh, as well as a desire to reach uh, or expand on uh, planned capacity. Um, to date, we have finalized sites at both regional office buildings and our site at 7120 here Ontario Street is actually undergoing its uh, um, soft launch today. Um, we have also uh, finalized uh, and confirmed sites at Caledon East, uh, as well as Brampton Soccer Center. Uh, we're continuing to finalize sites, uh, a number of sites in uh, all three municipalities at this point in time, and we will share those names once we're available to do so. Um, and our planned capacity uh, at this time is to reach at least 26,000 doses per day with an ability to scale up close to 43,000 doses a day over eight fixed sites uh, and uh, providing that the hospital sites also remain operational at their planned capacity, which could also increase as well, depending on allocations and timeline. Next slide, please. Having well-executed clinics established as soon as possible is critical, but so is ensuring that we plan clinics that meet the needs of key populations. And we have been very, uh, we have uh, really highlighted the importance of community engagement and planning. And under this area of focus, we are taking an integrated approach to support uh, planning and execution of the va vaccine rollout. Uh, the community planning table consists of health and social system leaders uh, to provide integrated and strategic leadership that supports implementation. And it also acts as a forum to support proactive planning for priority groups and leverage capacity across the system. There's also a community equity and engagement advisory table that really aims to uh, address equity and access issues uh, experienced by racialized and marginalized communities in Peel. Um, and they will provide guidance to ensure that equity considerations are consistently applied in our planning and execution. Um, and we have also established nine population planning tables, uh, at, which you can see at the bottom there. Uh, these will essentially support sustained engagement with key priorities, priority populations and community partners, uh, ensuring that we are responsive to community needs. The objective of having a strong and high level community engagement, high, high intensity community engagement is to maximize vaccine uptake through an inclusive, sensitive and collaborative process that encourages and fosters uh, individual, uh, individual participation. Next slide, please. Public health communications, uh, our approach continues to expand uh, and really focuses on both the what and why, which is why people should get vaccinated, addressing questions and concerns of hesitancy, how the vaccines work, et cetera, uh, and of course, prioritization. And then also the how, uh, which is the biggest question that's really being asked right now. It's the operational question about when is it my turn and where can I get the vaccine and all those other pieces. Um, the overall vaccine communications is integrated into our broader uh, communications approach around public health measures, including uh, the core four of distancing, masking, et cetera, uh, take care reboot, uh, which you see in the bottom left corner, and also the bottom right corner, which really communicates around self-isolation, voluntary self-isolation centers, and the need to uh, avail people of provincially provided testing uh, capacity. Uh, all materials that will be offered uh, will be offered through numerous channels, uh, web, social media. It's all being actively communicated at this point in time already and will continue to expand in outreach. Uh, and translated materials are being offered in all areas uh, in, and being vetted, of course, by the community engagement structure that we were described that, that I described in the previous slide. The goal is really to ensure that uh, our community is engaged in vaccination as a part of the conversation and how we can help, we know that how we can help them with information is of paramount importance in ensuring that our investment in uh, mass vaccination uh, is fully realized. Next slide, please. This uh, slide highlights some of the tactics that will be deployed in communication, knowing council's interest in terms of uh, supporting uh, broader communication and engagement with the community. Um, and uh, this uh, will all be done with the community through the engagement that I described earlier and through community ambassadors, uh, for example, to our diverse communities, those experiencing uh, homelessness, those individuals with disability or access issues, um, and certainly uh, those uh, are, are, you know, our urban indigenous communities. Uh, we are gonna be using a combination of tactics, uh, you know, as described here, uh, to keep pushing out a message, uh, to keep encouraging people to understand the importance of vaccination and how it really supports our 
our community goals um, in, in terms of uh, trying to bring the pandemic to a close. Um, really, our communication uh, is also aiming to facilitate uptake through the promotion of uh, accessibility, ease of clinic options, information of when and where and how, and for which population groups uh, we are trying to get vaccinated at uh, certain points in time. So I will uh, move to the next slide then, uh, just in terms of next steps. Uh, we are actively preparing for vaccine rollout. Uh, the focus continues to be that we are uh, ready uh, to quickly ramp up uh, to significant capacity and have vaccines in arms uh, when the supply comes available. Uh, we are taking steps, additional steps to uh, uh, continuously expand our vaccination capacity, finalizing and preparing sites, hiring staff, uh, continuing communications with residents, community engagement, uh, you know, and continuing to work with uh, within our own structures to address uh, certain enablers such as the information management system, appointment booking system, and logistics, among others, while also continuing to advocate uh, for the province and their enablers to come online. Uh, this continues to be uh, the great project of our time, and more information about our vaccination plan is available online at peelregion.ca forward slash coronavirus forward slash vaccine. Uh, details around the plan, a, a detailed copy of the plan is going to be uh, released uh, today uh, following my presentation, uh, and the website will continue to be updated regularly as we move from planning to execution. So that uh, concludes the vaccine part of my presentation. Before I move to discuss uh, very quickly and briefly our my recommendations around the upcoming reopenings, I'd like to pass it to um, CEO Baker to provide her input and their and um, insight uh, as to uh, the overall um, regional corporation's response uh, in supporting the vaccination rollout. Uh, CEO Baker. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowe, and thank you for everything that you're doing and your tremendous leadership on this file. I just wanted to take a minute to reiterate to Council a point that I made um, a few weeks back, and that is the impact that this project, uh, not just the, the response, but now this standing up of this mass vaccination project is having uh, on our staff resources across the region, uh, because this really is a full corporate uh, response to this uh, new uh, requirement to stand up these vaccination clinics and, and get needles in arms. And, and it, it is having an impact on other regional operations. So I just wanted to take a minute to highlight that for Council uh, because our staff capacity at all levels right now is, is very um, constrained. Uh, for uh, operations outside of the COVID world. Uh, for example, this week we have paused all non-COVID hiring um, because our human resources staff are completely consumed with trying to onboard the 30 to 50 people a week and, and more as we need them uh, to get them up on into our uh, employment and then get them trained for uh, the, the job that we're going to be asking them to do. We have IT projects that are going to be delayed, uh, programs that are primarily internal that we can slow down have been slowed. Uh, and while we continue to, to maintain our frontline services, we are doing it, I think, with, with you know, the, the minimums that we need to do uh, in order to deliver those. So uh, the level of engagement across the entire organization is immense. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, we can appreciate that the province has come along and quite understandably so for us to stand up emergency childcare and emergency isolation centers, all really critical supports to the effort. But every single one of those initiatives requires uh, a lot of person power across the region in order to implement. So I think quite understandably, we are concerned about cast, uh, staff capacity. We're concerned about staff wellness. We're concerned about our ability to sustain this, and even though we know that we must now for several more months. So I think it's important for Council just to have an awareness of something that we are managing internally, and I, I commend every, every uh, person who works for the region because I can tell you they are committed and, uh, you know, moving mountains in order 
order to make this happen, and I'm sure Dr. Lowe would agree with me on that. So uh, we're immensely grateful, but you know, it does put some of our non-COVID programs uh, at risk of, of slowing down some, or maybe even having to be paused for a while. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, as we manage through this, I've committed to let council know if there are any critical mm -hmm. slowdowns or stoppages. I think at this point, we're, we're, the lights are on, the services are being delivered, but there is an immense um, effort be, uh, going on behind the scenes. We are, uh, overtime is being required and asked and worked. Uh, and, you know, we all know that overtime uh, takes a toll. So um, just really uh, 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 my message is, um, you know, be aware that you have a, a corporation right now that is really, uh, it's like an elastic band. I think we've stretched it almost to the limit. We're trying not to stretch it till it breaks. So uh, with that, I will turn it back to do Dr. Lowe. So uh, thank you through the chair. I'll bring it back to my final slide, uh, which is uh, the graph. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, last thing that I wanted to leave you with, uh, Council, is that we are very much currently in a race between the variants and vaccines. And you are uh, probably familiar with this slide. Uh, it was previously presented by the provincial science table and really showing that as the variants, uh, which are increasingly being detected in our community, uh, continue to spread, uh, the risk of reopening too quickly uh, is that uh, we, can, we might see our doubling time for cases uh, dropping to 10 days in March uh, from current 45 days, which is a really significant um, uh, concern. I think, uh, you know, I believe further modeling is being presented by the provincial table uh, today at three o'clock, and I'll be curious to see what, um, what the message is um, uh, or what the, uh, what the um, modeling shows. Uh, but the message that I do want to portray is that we are in a very interesting situation. Our trends are favorable uh, from our new cases. Our hospitalization picture is just starting to stabilize. Um, we're starting to see things go in the right direction. However, we also know that we are in a situation where we have more and more variants and not a lot of vaccine. Um, and so to the extent that uh, over the next uh, few weeks, uh, as more vaccine arrives and we try to slow the spread of variants, what we do and the decisions we take uh, as a community are going to be absolutely crucial. It could make the difference between a successful vaccine rollout and uh, an exit from the pandemic or a third wave, uh, which would then uh, Im impede our vaccine rollout just by virtue of uh, capacity again being overwhelmed, uh, needing to uh, respond uh, to increasing hospitalizations, ICU deaths, all those other pieces uh, with the case and contact tracing uh, pieces there. So we're actually in a very favorable position at this point in time. And I was uh, very supportive, uh, certainly, of our return uh, and reopening of school uh, in, uh, you know, next week. Um, I think we recognize that uh, at these levels of transmission, uh, we're, we were roughly in October, November, schools were still open and precautions that were being taken at that, even at that time ensured that uh, there was no additional transmission seen in the school settings. We also know that the benefits of having children in, in, in class learning are significant both for a reduction in screen time, uh, but also in respect of uh, their overall, overall well-being, socialization, development, uh, in, in addition to their learning. Uh, so I was uh, very happy to support that with the recognition, of course, that uh, it will result in changes in our community interactions. It will result in uh, you know, potential increased contacts. Um, where I do sit and I do recognize that the province has mentioned an anticipated move uh, back into the provincial reopening framework uh, six days after our schools reopen. Uh, you know, I, I, and I understand, of course, that the framework has also been revised to permit uh, reopening of certain sectors, which I, you know, I certainly agree uh, on their own um, would not necessarily pose, a, you know, a threat. I think it's really important to remember, though, that uh, if you open too many things all at the same time, um, I think the message gets confused. Uh, and also, there is also a risk of, um, you know, essentially the variant starting to spin further out of control. Uh, so I, I think um, I think we the important thing that I would really uh, impress upon Council, uh, while recognizing that we all want this to be over, we know that a, a, a vast majority, a vast bulk of vaccine is slated to come 
uh, it's according to the delivery schedule starting from in just two weeks time um, through March and then we're going to be able to start vaccinating hopefully uh, we're ready to go uh, in terms of our clinics they're just uh, it, you know to, to the extent that we're, we're waiting for the supply so that we can start um, pushing this out more and more um, like I said we're in a situation where uh, we've lots of vaccines uh, we've lots of variants and uh, not that many vaccines and ideally uh, as we start to gradually reopen we can try to get to a point where uh, we were open slowly enough so that that situation can also uh, tilt uh, in favor of vaccines rather than variants. So with that, I will thank uh, Council's indulgence uh, for the significant amount of time that I've spent speaking today together with CEO Baker, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Lawrence, thank you. I have a list. First up is Mayor Crombie, but she did let the chair in the, the clerk's office know that she might have to have stepped away between one and two for an AMO, MOU meeting where I think she has to make quorum as well. But just in the odd chance, she's first on my list that she's within earshot and has a break and can ask her question, but I'm guessing not. So I go to the next speaker, uh, Councillor Starr. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Lowe, uh, again, thank you very much for bringing us up to date. Uh, Etc. And um, I'm just wondering, and I saw a chart someplace on one of the sites, uh, where are we percentage wise or on a pro rata basis um, with all of our numbers and with vaccine release and how much are we getting, uh, the delays? And I, I'm just wondering where we sit in the grand scheme of things as Peel Region uh, versus other regions or other spots in the country. And I thought I saw a chart, I'm not sure if it was uh, provincially or maybe it was private, where they showed um, the, the variances and some of them were significant. Do you have any information on that? Um, so through the chair to Councillor Starr, just to clarify the question, you're talking about what percentage of Peel's population has been vaccinated at this point in time? No, no I'm talking about uh, overall uh, the numbers, com our numbers comparing to other uh, municipalities, other locales, uh, two things. Uh, the numbers that we are experiencing insofar as the COVID uh, pandemic and the secondary, whether we are getting our fair share of vaccine uh, delivered to us compared to other parts of whether it's Ontario or the country. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Starr, for the question. Uh, so at this point in time, we do re remain the uh, uh, worst hit health region in uh, the province. Uh, and uh, I, if, if my memory serves correctly, the provincial, uh, the provincial data shows that we're at 123 per 100,000 uh, incidence rate, uh, which is uh, higher than our most recent, uh, higher than our second, uh, the second um, uh, highest, which is Toronto at 112 per 100,000 and York, which is at 70, I believe, per 100,000. Um, and then in respect of vaccines, at this point in time, uh, vaccines have been allocated at the federal level on a population per capita basis and then and on the provincial level uh, on a per capita basis. Uh, so it is based on population. And uh, at this point in time, I, I don't believe that allocations have been made accounting for um, transmission patterns. Do you not think it's important that if we're at the at the bottom or the top of the list that we should be allocated uh, more vaccine? So uh, through the chair to Councillor Starr, uh, I think that is the position that our mayors have taken. And certainly from my perspective, just thinking about uh, not just Peel, but really the province of Ontario as a whole uh, and really Canada as a whole uh, in terms of trying to uh, exit this and also uh, you know, limit uh, mortality and severity. Um, it would make sense to, uh, it, I, I imagine it would make sense in any allocation priority uh, to consider something like transmission and determining um, overall doses while accounting for many other factors as well. But, but certainly it, it might make sense to consider that, I would say. As a secondary on that, uh, have we started to administer the second dose already? So, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so uh, through the chair to Councillor Starr, uh, yes, we are currently administering second doses of Moderna to all of our long-term care and high-risk retirement home residents. Um, and we also, are, uh, our hospital partners will be administering their second doses starting from this weekend uh, and going through the 24th, uh, now that they are starting to receive their Pfizer allocations after the delay. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's great because I saw in the news that some of the municipalities already finished their second dose uh, already. 
Okay, the, and the other one I, I'd like to ask you about, and it's kind of a general question. Uh, there's been um, uh, videos and YouTube and all the rest of it on some of this uh, with respect to the negative effects of, of, the, of the vaccine. And there was one just recently that went viral where, where the lady was shown um, in tremors and shaking and uh, advocating that this is what happened to me. I wanted to go out. Uh, and, and then I saw another... Uh, study, I guess it was, or at least uh, uh, anecdotal, uh, how many hundreds have been affected. Uh, do we have any data or information on that sort of thing here? Yeah, so through the chair uh, to Councillor Starr, uh, there is a robust uh, adverse event surveillance uh, program that's in effect. It's important to remember that uh, for any immunizations that are given, uh, if there's something uh, adverse that occurs following it, it gets reported, but it may not necessarily always be related to the vaccine. It has to undergo a, a, an assessment for causality. Um, I don't have the exact numbers right now, and I believe those will be those will be shared at the provincial level in any at any rate. Um, but uh, overall data and evidence at this point in time, especially millions of doses having been uh, having been um, uh, provided worldwide, uh, suggests that the uh, rate of adverse events uh, that are correlated to the vaccine administration are is extremely low, um, and that uh, you know the rate of serious adverse events is is uh, very remote uh, as well. So. Um, uh, the, there is always a strict post-marketing surveillance program in place whenever any vaccine is rolled out uh, and overseen by our federal counterparts of the Public Health Agency of Canada. That infrastructure remains, and certainly uh, it will continue to monitor and uh, advise if there are any concerns. Uh, at this point in time, that system has not identified any concerns. Okay, and my last uh, minor, or maybe with me as a major point, is uh, as we got the, the, the new chart or the uh, all the information out on the changes and the reopenings and uh, adjustments, um, the one that stood out and jumped out at me again, 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 Dr. Lowe, is the personal shops, the personal care. They, I don't know, you know, we're allowing hundreds of people to congregate. We've opened up the schools, yet these shops that are basically one and two operator shops or people that, uh, uh, whether it's skin aesthetics or whatever all they do, and they're, and they're willing, they've come to you, they've come to us saying we're doing on a one-to-one -one basis, appointments only, yet they keep getting shut out. What do, you know, what do we have to do? I, I mean, let's open. It, it, it's not fair, and you're part of that group. It's not fair that we open up uh, all other areas, yet smaller shops, which have not been proven to give any other uh, adverse effects uh, or, or at least uh, um, comments, and we haven't got anything back from them to say there's something happening because they've never been open. So, how do we keep continuing to do that? Uh, so, through the chair to Councillor Starr, I certainly understand uh, the frustration of, uh, of not just personal service settings, but uh, numerous other business owners, and I certainly feel for them. Um, I think it's really important for me to just reiterate my comments at the very end. I think overall, uh, these next few weeks are crucial um, as we try to increase our vaccine coverage and supply, uh, and also try to slow the spread of variants to ensure that the, the rollout is successful. I know it's been a very difficult winter, um, and I, know that I, I sincerely hope that these businesses avail themselves of all the supports that are needed. Uh, but ultimately, the reopening framework is provincial. Um, I have not made one recommendation one way or the other in respect of those shops specifically. And I think there is good research evidence that suggests that uh, while uh, you can have uh, you know one-to-one -one people, appointments, et cetera, the reality is that those are uh, often services that are provided uh, within two meters uh, and for which uh, masks uh, are not a guarantee. Um, and, uh, and I think that is uh, to, to the extent uh, um, that um, there, the concern was at higher levels of community transmission that needed to be done. Uh, and at this point, as we're starting to see favorable trends, it really is a matter of trying to figure out uh, how, uh, trying to figure out how the province is going to stage the reopening of various economic sectors. Uh, regardless of what the province does decide, ultimately, my plea remains the same. I think at least just for the next few weeks, we just need to hold on a little bit longer um, because, uh, you know, if we reopen too quickly, we may very well end up in a third wave. And I don't, I, I sincerely don't want and don't believe that a third wave to save lives and, and to protect the healthcare system is going to bode well for any of our small businesses. So, um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I 
the message is the same. That our our only weapon at this point in time is patience until we get more vaccine. Well, well, then I'm going to make a suggestion, Dr. Lowe, that you go back to this group and say, shut down all the physiotherapy uh, locations and all the doctor's offices because they're working within one and two feet. And I can tell you that because of an accident I had, I'm at physio and they are within, within a foot or inches of the injury. And that's no closer than the personal shop uh, that remains closed next door to the, the location I go to. And yet they'll have eight and 10 people in that location and eight or 10 staff. What's wrong with this picture? You know, I'm, I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, if you're just re reiterating and regurgitating what the province is saying and we don't have it and we don't have any say as a region, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, maybe maybe the the uh, the province can tell us where we can get the brown paper wholesale, because that's what we're going to have to put all over these windows of these shops. I, I'm frustrated. Uh, it's, there's nothing happened. Nothing's happened. It just, so, anyway, glad to see that uh, somebody's not listening to us, and I'm frustrated. Thank you for your comments and for your input. Uh, Chair Starr, thank you, and I, I know you're conveying that message on behalf of a lot of folks. I do want to step back, though, uh, Ron, and speak to something that you mentioned, because I think it has to be said, particularly in Mayor Crombie's momentary absence and Mayor Brown's and, and Mayor Thompson's here. From the get-go, when the vaccine started arriving, to your point about how are they going to meet it out, and John Tory, to his credit as well, when we met with the mayors and chairs, we argued from the outset this shouldn't be um, a um, proportional, you know, there's so many people in every hamlet, so you get the same proportion. It should be based on need, no different than when you go to a hospital and, and if they're triaging and I've got a broken nail and you're having a heart attack, it doesn't matter if I was here an hour earlier, it should go to where the need is. So we've argued from the beginning, Mayor Brown, Mayor Crombie, Mayor Tom Vosivit, and Mayor, Mayor uh, John Torrey, John, that we would hope there is some reckoning from those that are giving out the vaccine to say, for the hot spots, for the places like Brampton where so many food workers are delivering product, you've got to believe that there's some incremental respect for the fact that we need a more proportionate share. So, Ron, you were making that point early on. It's been made for weeks now on behalf of those other folks that can't speak to it now. But the point is well made. I must tell you we get a lot of pushback from the hamlets that are further away that somehow how do we explain this to our constituents because it looks like you're robbing us to serve yourselves. And we're saying, no, it's no different than the hospital. Give it where the need is. So, Ron, good of you to bring it up. want you to know that we are really pushing on that file as well. Thank you. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Lowe, for your presentation. So I have a couple of questions with regard to the vaccinations. Um, first of all, um, I, I'd raised this a couple of weeks ago that I had heard, I think it was um, it was one of the members of the vaccination team from the province that they were talking about the registration for the vaccinations would be a provincial um, operation. And I raised that as a concern because our experience with operations on webs, websites that the province does has not been very positive. Um, we have an excellent process here in Peel that we used for our flu vaccines that was um, seamless, very accessible. Um, it worked really, really well, and it was um, a very direct service to our residents. Have you been hearing anything else about the province planning to take over the uh, the registration process everywhere? That that really worries me. I, I have to say I'm, I'm very concerned if that happens. So I'll, I'll ask that one first, and then I'll go to the others. So through the chair to Councillor Sato, thank you for the question. Uh, so, as I described in the presentation, uh, the um, the province is uh, intending to actually uh, centralize a scheduling system and registration system through COVAX, which is the uh, uh, the IT solution. Uh, we continue to provide our input and recommendations as to how uh, that can be addressed. Uh, but in the meantime, we're not sitting still. We are making use of our own IT uh, systems and facilities to make sure that we're ready to go uh, if the provincial system doesn't necessarily uh, uh, come to fruition in time, uh, and certainly if it doesn't necessarily deliver for our residents. Thank you. 
Thank you. I was looking for that in the presentation and I kept flipping back through the slides and I missed it. I've been having some network issues today, so you cut out for a while on me. Um, so my other question is, uh, and please do keep advocating for that because we can do it a lot better. Um, the locations that are being selected, um, and, and you don't need to give me an answer right now, but I would ask that when we're selecting the locations for the max vac mass vaccination, that we look at very closely at transit access to those particular locations. So for example, um, two of the locations, one which is the region of Peel, one at uh, here Ontario and Derry, um, and one other that I know has been proposed in Mississauga, are a minimum one hour and three, two to three bus changes um, for the residents in the northwest part of the city. I would imagine for Councillor Raz's residents in the southwest part of the city, it would be even much, much longer and many more bus changes. And for someone who has accessibility issues um, that, or a senior who doesn't drive and has to rely on transit, we need to make it as easy as possible for them to get there. So um, I'll just leave that with you as an ask, um, mostly on behalf of our community with disabilities um, and uh, and seniors. And, you know, it looks like the with the delays in the vaccines, the weather may be not too bad by the time they need to get there, but uh, you never know what happens in March and April around here. Um, my other concern with regard to the number of vaccines, so, I had heard different numbers um, from the prime minister the other day was, was saying, well, we're going to have 4 million by the end of March. Well, if you're telling us we need 2.5 million and federally there's, they're, you know, all ecstatic about the fact that they're getting 4 million. Um, it, it, it didn't seem to me to bode very well that we're going to get our 2.5 or I think in your chart, it added up between that one period of time. That was 2 million right there. So um, again, the, the advocacy that we have been doing, that we need to get the vaccinations, the vaccines here in Peel, where the numbers are so high, you know, we, we really need to stress that, stress that story, because, you know, my residents keep saying, well, 4 million across the country, like, what are we getting? And that's the big question is, what are we getting? And when are we going to get it? So you don't need to answer that today. It's, uh, um, also, I, I want to say as we're moving into the different framework, which is uh, just going to confuse everyone all over again. And of course, next week, um, Halton, I believe, moves into, they move into gray next week, correct? I, uh, through the chair, I believe they move into red. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Oh, they're in okay. gray, well, they're in gray right now. Whichever one it is, they get to open a lot of their retail stores a week before Peel does. So um, we we can expect that, you know, everyone in Peel that's been waiting to to go and shop in some of those larger stores in particular, you know, whether it's appliance stores, furniture stores, whatever, clothing stores, um, are going to be flocking to Halton. And, and this isn't anything you can you can handle. I just want to make a comment that they would have been a lot smarter to have put the entire GTA in at the same time to um, prevent our residents flocking to the Oakvilles, the Miltons, the Burlingtons, and Hamilton to do their shopping um, because it's so close and so easy to to get there. Um, what's my other? Oh yes. Um, with regard to the framework, I wonder if, you know, I, I was chatting with our lawyer, Andra Maxwell, the other day because I had a resident ask me a question about um, a business that was allowed to open and questions about how they determined what capacity their business was so that they could figure out 50% or whatever. And uh, she said, well, it's all in the regulations. So I went to the provincial website and I read the actual regulation and nowhere could I find that information. It did refer me to another regulation. When I entered that in the search engine, it said it didn't exist. Um, no wonder businesses have a hard time knowing what they're doing or what they can do. So I'm, I'm wondering if from a Peel perspective, if we could have somehow 
a much simpler um, explanation than what the province has because you know referring residents to that provincial website and the regulation is just an effort in frustration i mean i was just i threw up my hands and went back to our lawyer and said can you find it for me because i can't and you shouldn't have to be a lawyer to find out what you can do and small businesses don't have time you know the retailers don't have time to be searching this stuff so um i think uh, I, i'm not depending on the province to help them um, as you know, if, depending who they call at the province, they get a different answer. Uh, we found that out with some of the, the questions during lockdown. So um, is, is this something that Peel could do? We, I mean, we have stuff, some stuff on our city website, but it's not as, not as informative as I think the businesses need. Uh, so through the chair to Councillor Sato, uh, just to quickly cover off a bit of... Uh, or just hearing some background noise. Yeah, I need to mute. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Through the through the chair to Councillor Sayo, thanks for all those points. I, I did want to respond to a few of them, actually, if I may. Uh, in respect of the um, uh, getting to various sites, uh, the current sites that have been uh, confirmed and announced are uh, just the beginning. There are additional sites that may be serving residents, uh, you know, closer to where they are, and then there also will be um, other modalities such as on-site and mobile vaccinations at you know workplaces or whatever the case might be. Uh, so, so certainly those will also be deployed uh, uh, once supply. Uh, issues resolve and, and certainly uh, don't want to make people take too many buses too far regardless of what the weather looks like. Um, in respect of uh, the um, the framework uh, overall as well as the uh, what businesses can do, uh, we will uh, continue to update our website at least the pewregion.ca forward slash coronavirus uh, website under the businesses tab. Uh, there's uh, usually uh, some simplified guidance for businesses that we've posted there um, and we can certainly continue to do that with the uh, anticipated changes with the return uh, to the region regional framework. Um, and uh, I think the last thing I would I would say is uh, there were uh, some conversations, certainly. Um, I know I conversed with other uh, medical officers of health uh, around uh, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area who uh, would have preferred to see a, a regional re approach to reopening. Um, but uh, certainly the, the decision that has been taken, both in respect of uh, when schools have reopened as well as, uh, as, well as the anticipated returns uh, staggered on the 16th and 22nd, I think that's just how it's been uh, how it's been derived at this point in time unfortunately okay and oops, sorry could i um could i ask to could you just clarify because i think i understand it but um i think there was some confusion in the new framework moving forward i believe that um you as a medical officer of health and all of the other mohs um, have been given a new authority that you can go to lockdown if numbers soar and you don't have to go through the province. Is that correct? Uh, so through the chair, uh, I understand that this would be a, 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 the emergency break that is described yeah. in the uh, yes. in the yeah. new reopening framework uh, is something that would have to be deployed uh, not by myself alone, but in conjunction with the decision by the chief medical officer of health of the province, Dr. David Williams. Um, and uh, and if there is a situation that is identified uh, where uh, there is a significant risk uh, to um, uh, to spread uh, growing quickly, uh, that that is a measure that could be uh, taken. I. I would highlight, as I said in my remarks, the hope that a gradual reopening may obviate the need for ever using that functionality, which is why I think, uh, you know, certainly recognizing the fatigue and frustration that's in the community, uh, we just need to really hold on a little while longer to make sure that we get vaccines up and keep the variants down. Thank you. And I, and I just wanted, Mr. Chair, just very briefly to comment on, Councillor Starr had mentioned about uh, personal service businesses opening and while I certainly sympathize with them you cannot compare a personal service a hairdresser a barber or a nail salon with um, physiotherapy and uh, and other health care workers because they they are essential um, to many people for their health um, and the others the personal service are they're not essential I mean they're nice to have but they're not essential to individuals um, definitely are essential to the business owners, but um, I, I can fully understand why um, why they are not deemed essential and the essential ones are allowed to open and hopefully they will be able to very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Groves. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Lowe, for the update. I imagine you're not getting very much sleep these days, but because uh, they really keep you busy. Um, I guess a, a, a couple of things. I um, I share the concern that uh, Councillor Sato raised with regards to the centralized system. I, I don't see that working very efficiently at all. I would prefer to have that within our own control so that you know we can service our residents. So I, I really have a concern there. So when you're talking to your uh, colleagues, um, please reiterate our concerns for, for, for that, with respect to that. Um, I have... Um, Earlier, you said that the vaccines are available to vulnerable residents living in a congregated area. I've got a uh, retirement home here in Bolton, um, and they reached out to the region just recently, and they were told that um, they're not a priority because they're a new um, uh, residence. However, the folks who are living in that um complex. They are vulnerable. They're seniors. They, I've got one resident there. She received the first dose and they, she's being told now she can't get the second dose because she doesn't, uh, because of the, where she lives. So that's a really um, huge concern for me because um, again, the, the residents that are there, they're all retired, retirees. And, um, and so when I'm hearing that they're being told by the region, that they're not on a, on a priority list because they're a new building. I am disappointed to hear that and concerned for the, the residents who are living in that building. So, uh, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Of course, please. Uh, so, uh, so through the chair to Councillor Groves. Uh, first of all, if someone's received a first dose, they should be getting a second dose. So, if you could forward the details or particulars to me and my team, uh, we uh, we can take a look and see what's happening there. Because uh, we uh, essentially, in the midst of, of the supply crunch, we were advised to stop vaccinating people with first doses so that everyone who got their first dose could get their second dose. Um, so, uh, I, I, if I believe the person may be uh, either just uh, have, unfortunately have received. Uh, incorrect information or, or maybe misunderstood. So certainly, uh, you know, if you can pass the particulars of the individual on, uh, we'd be happy to review uh, what the situation is. Um, in respect of uh, retirement homes, I want to be very clear uh, in terms of the overall priority settings that I went through in my presentation, uh, that uh, first of all, the province unlocks the priority groups. Uh, so uh, based on the allocations they provide, they will also identify which groups are being prioritized. At this time, the province has identified long-term care homes and high-risk retirement homes, uh, and high-risk de being determined by the Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility. Um, and so it is entirely possible that the home that you're describing uh, was not classified by the Provincial Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility as a high-risk home, and therefore would not have been accounted for in the allocation that we received. Um, it does seem a bit odd that one resident would get vaccinated and not the others, though. Um, so, I, I mean, certainly the particulars of the situation are something we would like to look into. Uh, and I do want to make very clear that the chart that I actually presented uh, shows uh, the priority groups that are anticipated for all of phase one, i.e. meeting through to the end of March um, and as uh, more supplies start to come in. So uh, as, more sub as the province allocates this more vaccine, they will also unlock more priority groups that will be within that list of bullets that are there. But for the time being, not all of those groups are currently being prioritized because of the amount of vaccine that we currently have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lowe. I will forward you the um, the email from um, from the uh, manager at the building, and then you can look into it further for me. Thank you. Um, and I guess uh, with regards to the um, the concern that uh, Councillor Starr raised with regards to the small businesses, I agree with Councillor Starr. We are going to see a lot of these businesses, and I know that the ones in Bolton, they've been struggling for a long time, and this pandemic has made it even that much harder for them. You know, I, I guess out of desperation, I had two businesses that decided to open their doors, and they received a letter from the Attorney General threatening to uh, jail put them in jail, you know, and, and I guess people are just desperate right now because these these folks are being hit hard. Uh, they've got, you know, their, their taxes to pay, they've got their, um, their expenses to pay, um, and, and they have 
very little income coming in. So I, I don't understand the whole thing. It's very frustrating because I, you know, you're sending children to school, they're vulnerable, they're part of the vulnerable sector, big box stores are open, it's packed in there. Like I drove by Costco on the weekend, the lineup was out the door and around the corner, crazy, and, and no social distancing, and not everybody in the lineup was wearing a mask. And so I continue to hear, and Mayor Thompson, you, you will agree with this, that we continue to hear from our small businesses here that they're, they're having real trouble even just hanging on. So I don't know what the province is doing. I don't think it makes any sense. Um, and however you can communicate this, Dr. Lowe, um, I, I would strongly urge you to do that with, the, uh, with your colleagues at the province. And I know that you expressed some concerns about reopening too soon and you, the concerns you have with the new variants and that, but at the same time, I'm not sure how we expect people to survive. I, I hear what you're saying with the uh, with your concerns, but I but I'm also concerned for for people's um, survival. So, through the chair, I think it might be uh, helpful uh, for me to respond. Uh, so, thank you, Councillor Grove, and certainly I didn't have an opportunity to respond with Councillor Starr uh, previously. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to highlight one thing. COVID-19 is a disaster. Um, it is a natural disaster. It is unfortunately a prolonged, slow-moving natural disaster, similar to an earthquake or a hurricane. And unfortunately, those will be over in a matter of days. This is a situation where, you know, person-to-person -person cont con uh, cont uh, contact and interaction is unfortunately a disaster uh, that we're seeing and we're experiencing. And I want to be very clear that the measures themselves have saved lives and have saved our healthcare system. And we do know that if you don't take the measures, you actually end up with uncontrolled viral spread uh, and overwhelming of the healthcare system and hospitals. And you also end up with a knock-on effect on the economy as well. Uh, I believe the recent economic data, uh, and uh, Councillor Kovac always likes to point out that I'm not an economist, but I, I, I can read at least these numbers. Um, I understand that the U.S. economy contracted 3.5% last year, which is not far off of the 5% that the Canadian economy con contracted uh, last year, but they have a death rate that is nearly 2.5 times ours. Um, so it really shows that you can stay open and leave your economy open, but you're going to have all the deaths and the hospital overwhelming on it, and you're still going to have the economic hit as well. Um, and so I think really I understand the struggle for survival to the extent that in any other natural disaster, we would provide aid to people. We would provide, uh, you know, all sorts of financial support, uh, ways to get people evacuated if they were in the way, in harm's way, et cetera. That needs to, I think, really be what comes to fruition. They've done the right thing by sacrificing, by staying home, by keeping, you know, the community safe, by, by slowing spread. And I've said long, you know, uh, and I've made my position very clear for a long time, that I, you know, while I do recognize that we need to close to reduce interactions and reduce spread, these people that need to close, there needs to be some reciprocity and some support for the fact that they have made that sacrifice to keep our frontline health healthcare workers and our essential workers safe and to save lives. And to the extent that, you know, I'm hearing that people are still struggling, then that suggests to me that perhaps in the midst of this disaster, the relief that they are being provided is perhaps not enough. And that's the only assessment that I can make of it in my uh, non-expert economic piece. But really the reality, and I think the United States offers us a, sig a significant counterfactual where they stayed largely open in many states and they still had a 3.5% economic contraction, which on a margin of error on 5%, not that much different. And considering that our contraction is probably related to their contraction in some in some regard. Yeah. All right, thank you, Dr. Dr. Lowen, just on a positive note, I, I am certified to administer vaccines and other types of injections. So if you ever get stuck, I'm volunteering my time. Okay, thank you. We'll keep, that, we'll keep that in <laughs> mind. <laughs> To the chair, if I may, I was going to say I'm looking to volunteer my time in some of our clinics as well once the vaccine gets here, definitely. Thank you. Councillor Paleshi. Yeah, I'm not certified to give any needles, but um, I, uh, I thank you. You, Dr. Lowe, and uh, just with respect to Councillor Sato and Councillor Grove's comments about the centralized system, I completely agree with what they're saying. Also, with respect to uh, what Councillor Groves was saying, in in Brampton, we too have Holland Christian Homes that uh, that had uh, an outbreak, had some uh, loss of life, yet they're not on the the list 
Um, and so, Dr. Lowe, if kind of the same thing with, with the Bolton, um, I guess it's because they're not assisted living, um, they're more on the side, even though they, they do have some assisted living there, um, they have more so just the senior residents. But that being said, if, if there's anything that you could do on, on the lobbying effort to try and get Paul and Christian home, some of the vaccines, I think it's, uh, you know, they were, they were hit early on in this. In, in the pandemic, one of the first, I believe. Um, so I'd hate to see them go through uh, anything else, if, if you could do that. So through the chair, I'm happy to look into it, Councillor Pleshi. Uh, you know, I, we, I, I must say our vaccine supplies are really quite thin. Um, we've been allocated 9,350 doses of Moderna for uh, roughly 9,000 second doses at this point in time, um, which really poses a challenge. Uh, and I, I am hopeful that a lot of these conversations will be relieved um, by, you know, the receipt of uh, of more and more vaccine. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are we're un unfortunately just really hamstrung by the um, by the uh, you know severe critical unavailability of vaccine. Um, but. Uh, we do have assurances from our provincial partners that in the uh, you know in the coming weeks uh, through into March uh, we should see this supply stabilize. Uh, you know they are going on the assurances of the manufacturers, and I'm hopeful then that we'll be able to continue resolving uh, issues such as the one you're describing. For sure, and I had a really good conversation with Dr. Naveed Muhammad there last week, and um, I'm reassured that the, you know we're doing everything that we can do, and I would just I would I'd rather have uh, more of a say like you, Dr. Lowe, and, and Dr. Naveed Bahamad, and, and um, other Peel uh, uh, health units in kind of the um, getting the vaccine out. But that's all I'll talk about, you know, the, the getting, getting the vaccine uh, into the arms. What I do wanted to ask you about is, um, <clears throat> is the patent protection on, on currently the Pfizer and Moderna, and I know that the province is looking at this currently, but under this state of emergency, do we not have the ability to remove the patent protection and start developing this vaccine on our, on our own? Can you talk a little bit about that? So uh, through the chair to Councillor Pileshi, uh, leaving aside the um, uh, the fact that uh, developing our own vaccine would require us to develop the manufacturing capacity and that wouldn't happen overnight. Um, I do believe there is a, a federal um, power called compulsory licensing. Um, and as I am not a lawyer, I am going to see if Patrick O'Connor can speak to uh, the concept of <laughs> compulsory licensing if he's able to speak to it. And Patrick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I can't elaborate greatly on compulsory licensing except to observe that that would be certainly a federal jurisdiction that we're talking about in terms of removing uh, patent protection. Yeah, so essentially the Fed, federal level, could they could determine, um, you know, that uh, this they could implement this, remove the patent protection if we ha had the ability to and, and what we're, I guess, essentially doing is stealing Pfizer or Moderna's um, uh, uh, their their vaccine components, and 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 then start start developing it ourselves. I, I guess, and and so currently, I don't know if the feds have ever announced that they're looking at it. I know the province is looking at some kind of patent protection, but do we have anybody in Ontario that we know of that can? basically take that vaccine and start roll, start man manufacturing it themselves for us? Uh, so through the chair uh, to Councillor Pleshi, uh, first of all, I, I don't want to specify one way or the other whether the feds uh, could or would do that. I, I think I just understand that there is a function called compulsory licensing, but unfortunately I'm not, um, uh, don't have enough expertise in that uh, matter to speak uh, to it and certainly something that I once engaged in, but would be uh, once engaged in and understood a bit about, but would need to brush up on my on my memory. Um, but uh, in respect of the actual availability of technology, I'm not aware of any uh, manufacturers in Ontario that would be able to develop uh, mRNA technology. I imagine uh, that it could be something, and perhaps it's something better asked to our private sector partners. Um, and I do believe I, I had seen a report somewhere about a company in Alberta that was actually trying to do uh, what Moderna had done earlier on. Um, but uh, don't have any further details on on their capability or capacity to do so at this time. Yeah, and I guess you know we're not. I'm not at the federal level. If it was up to me, I'd be advocating every day to steal the vaccine and and start manufacturing it. But I'm not. I'm somebody that 
and like us all, probably put life over money any day of the week. Dr. Lowe, you mentioned it, and I'm glad you did. Um, you know, we're essentially where we were this time last year with respect to these evolving um, strains of the vaccine, where we're kind of heading into, uh, you know, the new ground. This is uh, uh, wave three is coming, um, and and we can obviously see that every day. It's a different number of these of these um, uh, different uh, uh, spreads. These these different variations. Um, so, I, and I think you talked a little bit about the, the communications aspect of it and, and, you know, reopening it's, it's kind of like a, what if, what do we do? Would love to have my, you know, hair salon, uh, open up, uh, my barber. I'm really missing him today. I can tell that you haven't had a haircut in a little while either. Um, but those opportunities, like it's, it, it, it makes sense for the, for I guess the one-on-ones because we haven't seen um, um, the the viruses in in those kind of one-on-one settings. It's more in these bigger ones. I guess FedEx just had a had a big outbreak with a lot of uh, uh, Peel regional uh, imp- uh, Peel uh, resident employees that that worked there too, which is unfortunate. But in terms of you know this wave wave three that's that's coming and and the remarks that our CAO has made where you know we're everybody's really busy everybody's you know it sounds to me and I don't want to put words in her mouth but it just it sounds like everybody's just giving it all and 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 we, we respect that so much but this next wave this wave three which has the potential to be worse than wave one and wave two what do we see for it? what what can we do differently um, to try and make sure that this does not get out of hand keeping aside the vaccine i i, I really don't i, I don't want to with everything that all the problems that are happening with the vaccine the distribution of the vaccine the eu now uh, saying that you have to limit the amount of vaccines that are going to uh, to north america uh, keeping aside that part of it what do we what do we do so through the chair uh, to Councillor Pleshi, uh, I, I mean, keeping aside the vaccine, uh, although the vaccine is really part of the reason why I think if we just make it through the hump of the next few weeks, um, that uh, we will see um, a very different picture as we start to reopen. And that's the other thing I wanted to stress is that we're not uh, talking about indefinite closures for any of our businesses by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, It is about really just trying to get through the next few weeks and this hump uh, while we get more vaccines and keep variants under control. Um, If this were a world where the vaccine was even further away, which I should add is a reality for many other countries uh, in the world, I was uh, seeing that uh, we're we're very fortunate, uh, at least the position that we have here. I understand that uh, for most of uh, the global south, uh, they're not going to see their first vaccines until 2022. um, And they're only just starting to see some of their more significant outbreaks at this point in time, uh, which uh, is going to have broader implications for us as Canadians in terms of supply chain, et cetera. So uh, I I think it would be the same advice that we've been uh, describing to some extent, Uh, you know, um, trying to limit our contacts, trying to uh, limit interactions, um, or just taking a broader question of uh, of just looking at um, looking at sort of the overall picture and and figure out if there's uh, other targeted approaches. I think, for example, we know that we have a significant essential worker challenge uh, in the region of mm-hmm. Peel. Um, so, would we change the strategy around how our manufacturing and our warehousing and distribution uh, is being undertaken, et cetera. Um, you know, I think um, I think there would be, you know, the data is pretty clear uh, in terms of, uh, and I want to be very clear that the closures and shutdowns have helped to really limit the extent of transmission outside of those uh, outside of those essential settings by essentially just keeping it within those settings. And that's where we've had such success in the region of Peel and uh, making sure that our hospitals weren't completely overwhelmed. Um, but uh, but yeah, it would it would essentially be the same dimmer switch plan that was described that I described to all of you when I first had the privilege of sitting in front of you um, uh, in in March of 2020 by saying where cases go up, we need to you know reduce the con- and the contact interactions, and where they go down, we need to be able to reopen with confidence uh, and with the measures around things like rapid testing and workplace inspections and precautions such as masking, et cetera, uh, still in play and also just limiting interactions as much as possible. Um, But over time, we also know that the viral picture is going to change. 
Um, we know that the virus is, uh, it, they've evolved into these more transmissible strains now, um, but they may also very well evolve into less virulent strains or whatever the case might be. And I think in the long run, the, the fate of COVID-19 will ultimately be to become part of the fall and winter respiratory panel, but that is probably still five or 10 years away of evolution and uh, passage through the population. So for the time being, with something as contagious and as novel and threatening, particularly to our seniors and our most vulnerable, it would still be that dimmer switch philosophy with you know the testing and the targeted uh, interventions as best we can. I, I think that's the best I can answer, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. And um, uh, before I go to communication, I don't think that report's before us yet. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just clarify, is that report before us? No, we're going to conclude this and then you're next up. Okay, Last, lastly, Dr. Lowe, I'm just asking for if you could maybe ask one of your staff to, to look into something for for us. And, and that's uh, uh, one thing is the, is the expression of trying to get the word out on vitamin D and the benefits to it. And also uh, the, the states right now is implementing in some areas um, <clears throat> for their schools, dog sniffing, uh, um, um, dogs that are able to to detect COVID on on the breaths of of children in the schools. If you could look into 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 that for me as well, I would appreciate that. I'm trying to find out as much research as I can, and I'm limited. If you have that ability, I would appreciate that. Uh, so through the chair, certainly the vitamin D uh, question is one that uh, I'd be happy to share um, with all of council at the weekly update on Friday. There's certainly, the, the evidence is not as clear cut, um, but uh, we do know vitamin D as a whole has benefits for bone health as well. Um, and uh, and Councillor Fleshy, to your second question around uh, detecting COVID dogs, I do know that the uh, provincial reopening uh, comes with a commitment from the Ministry of Education for um, uh, more expanded testing uh, of uh, school populations and and so I think uh, I think that will that acts as a bit of a proxy for what you're describing. But I'm curious to look into the uh, the dog surveillance method myself. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and Dr. Lowe and Michael. Just to your point, one other thing was in the news last week. Um, you know, it's hard to get somebody to break their patent or go after their patent protection. But what they're doing in Europe as well is for the main manufacturers that sort of have the secret sauce and the recipe and the secondary manufacturers that make generics, for example, that have factories that they've never been in research and development, they just wait the 25 years and make the generics, they are allowing the firm with the patent and the secret sauce and the secret recipe to use their facility for a fee. And how simple is that? Because you still keep patent protection and you're not pumping out generics for anything right now. We'll just shift some trucks over some of your expertise. Let's get our production line going. Seems like a pretty good solution as well, which, as I say, I understand is being done in Europe as well. Okay, Councillor Kovac. Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. And uh, if I'm experiencing any lag or if I get cut off at any point, uh, just let me know. Uh, Dr. Lowe, I want to thank you for your presentation today, and uh, I hope I didn't cause any offense when I referred to it at some point as our expert medical officer of health. Perhaps I tagged on not an economist, but uh, very few of us are so many things in expert form, but you certainly are uh, admired by myself and all of regional councils. So thank you for your great work. And um, wanted to comment uh, just a little bit um, and, and ask a question, but Councillor Starr earlier had asked about potential adverse side effects. Uh, late last year in December, um, I had asked a question, we'd gotten into it a little bit when the vaccine was first being rolled out in the United Kingdom. There were a couple of uh, medical providers who I guess had a history or have a history of allergies and then uh, experienced anaphylaxis. And the National Medical Director for the NHS England, National Health Service, Stephen Powell said, as is common with new vaccines, the MHRA, Medicines and Healthcare Products Red Regulatory Agency, have advised on a precautionary basis that people with a significant history of allergic reactions do not receive vaccination related to COVID-19. Um, common, so common adverse side effects, according to the CDC, are headache, fatigue, dizziness, nausea, chills, fever, pain, difficulty breathing. It can happen at the 
the site where the vaccine would be administered and can last up to seven days, perhaps even longer than seven days after that.